As the Buddha said, even if you can't read the minds of others, make sure at the very least you can read your own mind. This is something you have to do at the beginning of the meditation. Get a sense of what shape your mind is in right now. One way of testing it is to get it to the breath and see how well it stays. And then learn to read it. Does it have too much energy, too little? Is it beset by worries? Were you suddenly thinking about something that somebody did to you today or in previous days? They can get you worked up. In other words, if the state of the mind is getting in the way of your staying with the breath, you're going to have to focus in on the mind first. This is the purpose of that third tetrad in the Buddhist instructions on breath meditation. The fact that it's placed third, we're dealing with about steps 9, 10, 11, and 12, may you lead you to think that you have to wait to deal with the breath first and then with feelings and finally get to the mind. But that's not the case. It's not the case that you start out just with the breath and then you add feelings and then you add the mind. And the mind is right there all along. And if the mind can't focus on the breath, you can't get anything done. So as the Buddha said, try to be sensitive with the state of the mind. It has too much energy. You deal with it one way. If you have too little energy, you deal with it in another way. For most of us, the problem is it has too little energy, especially when you're meditating in the evening. It's the end of the day. And so the first step is to gladden the mind. You can do that in several ways. One is by the way you breathe. Breathe in a way that feels refreshing, energizing. Or you can do with different perceptions. This is what the recollections are for. Recollecting the Buddha. The fact here was an excellent human being. He left behind a teaching for us, and we're privileged to be able to practice it. It's not the case that everybody has this opportunity. For most people, the pressures of the world are pressing so hard on them, they don't have time. But here we have the time, we have the place. So take advantage of this privilege while you've got it. Recollection of the Dharma, that this is an excellent teaching. You look at it, you read through it, and you see it's teaching nothing but noble things, noble ways of behaving, responsible ways of behaving. That's something that's timelessly true. It's as true now as it was in the time of the Buddha. Or you can recollect the Sangha. If you read through the Tarigata, Tarigata, you find that there are people in the past who had lots of problems, many of them very similar to yours, sometimes even worse, and yet they were able to overcome them. They found the strengths within them to overcome their problems, and you think they could do it, you, you can do it too. In other words, you use various perceptions to lift the mind, energize the mind, gladden the mind. After all, here we are in, in a world where there has been a Buddha. We're coming up on the, the anniversary of the Buddha's cremation, seven days after Wisaka. The Malas finally got around to cremating the Buddha. The original plan was to cremate him the first day, but they spent so much time making pavilions, getting their act together, and beginning in their songs and their dances in honor of the Buddha. That evening came, so it's too late in the day. They said, we'll do it tomorrow. And then the second day, 
spent so much time in songs and dances and ceremonies in, in honor of the Buddha all day long that they ran out of time. This kept up until finally the seventh day they got their act together earlier in the morning. And as the Buddha said, after he was cremated, his ashes should be collected in a burial mound. And it would be a place for people to come and develop a sense of confidence. Basada is the Pali term. And it's ironic that in the commentaries and in the Thai traditions, I learned it. The places where the ashes are kept, the places associated with the Buddha, the place where he was born, where he was enlightened, where he gave his first sermon, where he passed away. They're called Sangwejiniya Satan, which means places for giving rise to Sangwega. The idea being that even a great person like the Buddha would have to pass away. But the Buddha himself said that these are places where he should develop a sada, sense of confidence. We live in the world, yes, where there is suffering. But we live in a world where a Buddha has gained awakening and left his teachings behind, and the teachings are still alive. So use that thought to give yourself a sense of confidence, a sense of uplifting joy, calm joy, but joy nevertheless, that the way is still open. So these are some perceptions you can use to gladden the mind. If, however, you find the mind is too, too active, too wired, you've got to steady it. Here again, you might use different ways of breathing to make it feel more steady. Or different thoughts, different perceptions. Death is riveting. Recollection of death. You could die at any time if you don't get your act together now. Suppose you were to die tonight. Would you be ready to go? And the answer usually is no. Okay, there's work to be done. Or if the mind is going to have extra energy, use it to think about the different aspects of the breath and the body. Whereas the breath and the spaces between your fingers right now, the spaces between the toes, other parts of the body that you tend to ignore. Take a really detailed inventory of the breath energy in the different parts of the body. Or you can think of the 32 parts of the body. Visualize each one by one by one. Ask yourself, where is that part right now? Because as long as the mind has energy to think, think about things in the body. That will lasso it in. So you can get it focused. And then the Buddha says, releasing the mind. One of the worst situations you can be in as you meditate is you go from thinking, thinking, thinking to falling asleep. It goes back and forth between the two. In other words, you finally get it to calm down. Once it's calmed down, it, you lose your focus. Okay, you've got to release it from both sides. A lot of times this is a sign of a lack of energy. You can't control the mind, which is why you're thinking. This is not thinking from a lot of energy. It's thinking from a lack of energy. Just You don't have much control over it, and the mind just starts spinning all kinds of nonsense. When it runs out of steam, then, then you fall asleep. So I found in cases like this, good heavy breathing is good. And of course, you're sitting here in a group, you don't want to make loud breathing. But think of long, deep breathing. Just to energize the body, energize the mind. And you'll find that you develop your own techniques. But these are the three things you want to look for. At what times does the mind need to be gladdened? At other times, what times it needs to be steadied? And what, what times does it need to be released? And 
and then work out the appropriate remedy until everything gets brought into balance, and then you can stay with the breath properly. And even here you have to learn how to read the mind. Once the mind settles down, there will still be things nibbling away at it. How do you make sure that you don't get distracted by the little nibbling thoughts? And secondly, how do you learn how to analyze your concentration? Because as you get deeper into concentration, it's not simply a matter of just more force. You have to understand, what is it that I'm holding on to in this level of concentration that's keeping it from getting deeper? This is another area where you have to think about releasing the mind. Learn to sense at what point you don't have to do any more directed thought and evaluation about the breath. It's as good as it's going to be. And just focus in on one point and try to get the mind to develop a sense of being at one with the breath. What perceptions help you with that? What per perceptions help you get so that the need for in and out breathing gets lighter and lighter? Or when the breath stops, what perception do you hold in mind so you don't get afraid? Because there will be that reaction. You suddenly realize, hey, I haven't been breathing for a while. Something's wrong. Nothing's wrong. What's happened is that the mind has gotten so still that you don't need all that extra oxygen. The breath energy in the different parts of the body connects. So if there's a felt lack in one spot, then the energy from another spot can come in and fill up the lack. You don't need to pull anything in from outside. And then after a while, because everything is still, the sense of the shape of the body will disappear. And you realize the only thing that's keeping you with that sense of form of the body is your image of the boundary of the body. Can you locate the act of the mind that's creating that image, and can you erase it, drop it, and replace it with a perception of space permeating the body and going out in all directions? So getting the mind into concentration requires reading the mind. Getting into deeper levels of concentration also requires reading the mind. Simply that the you get more and more into the fine print. The Buddha gives you directions in those steps of breath meditation. He talks about being sensitive to mental fabrication which are feelings and perceptions. Both the question of what kind of perceptions can you deal with to cut through your hindrances, and then once the mind has settled down, what, hind what perceptions can you use to bring the mind to deeper and deeper levels of concentration. You're seeing how feelings and perceptions really do have an impact on the state, state of your mind. And that's an important insight. The Forest of John's talk about how we don't need to think about all five different aggregates. If you focus on one, and the lessons you learn about one particular aggregate will then seep into the others. And perception tends to be the one that they focus on most. What image you're holding in mind? How do you understand what's going on there? What images are you holding that are useful? Which ones are you holding on to that are not useful? Because the problem with these perceptions is we mistake them for the reality, and they shape the reality. The Buddha's images perceptions as mirages. They look like something real, but you get there and there's nothing. It's an image, and a lot of times that's what we're dealing with. 
when there's anger in the mind. It's usually an image, and the image is what provokes the anger. When we're feeling lust, okay, we've created an image in the mind. Lust often very, has very little to do with the actual body that you're thinking about. It has more to do with the image. Same with all the defilements. So the practice of concentration gets us very sensitive to how we're playing with images and how the images have a different impact on the mind. So you can begin to question their role not only while you're sitting here doing concentration, but also as you go into the world. What are the images that are driving you crazy? This is another way in which the Buddha says, basically, the cause of suffering is inside. The world may be horrible, but that's not what's making us suffer. It's what the mind is doing with the input from the world, good or bad. A large part of what we're doing is applying perceptions that then aggravate problems. So you want to learn how to master this issue of perception. Don't mistake the perception for the reality outside or the realities inside. Just ask yourself, at what point are they useful and which points are they not? This way, the issue of reading the mind, which starts out simply as a question of how do I get the mind to settle down, turns into the activity of discernment. So at first you're peeling away blatant defilements, and then as you're reading the mind, you're beginning to peel away more and more refined ones. But you find that the big issues are usually around feeling and perception. And the way you talk to yourself about these things. And the breath is a good anchor for keeping you in the present moment so that these conversations and perceptions don't point you away to the past or to the future. It's in that way that all these forms of fabrication, bodily, verbal, and mental, are are important for learning how to read the mind, which is why the Buddhist breath instructions cover all three kinds. He talks explicitly about bodily fabrication to alert you to the fact that we're looking at the breath not simply as the breath, but it's in its impact on how you sense the body. Mental fabrication, we're looking at feelings and perceptions and how they shape the mind. And then the instructions themselves, when you tell yourself, I will breathe in sensitive to rapture, breathe in, sensitive to pleasure, whatever. Those are verbal fabrications. They're all right there. And they're all useful in every stage of getting the mind to settle down, getting it to understand itself. So read your mind. Learn how to decipher the code in which its messages are written. And you find that you understand it all the way through. 